Yes, Mr. Hodge. Commissioner, the, the next witness is Mr. Oliver. Just before he gives evidence, can I just note something, which is I'm told by the junior counsel for NAB, and I'm sure it's right, that the document I referred to this morning, which is ASIC.0036.0003.0730, which I'd said had not previously been subject to an application for a non-publication direction, had in fact been subject to a non-publication direction that was sent to the solicitors assisting, I'm told, at 12.18am on Monday the 6th of August. So I correct that from this Thank morning. Thank you, Mr Hodge. The next witness is Mr Oliver. Mr Oliver, would you come into the witness box, Mr Oliver? And would you prefer to make an oath or take an affirmation? Uh, the oath, please. Yes, can we swear the witness, please? I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence that I shall give. Will be the truth. Will be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you, Mr. Oliver. Do sit down, please. Yes, Mr. Peters. Well, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Mr. Oliver, is your full name Mark Oliver? It is. And is your current business address Level Three, Thirty Hickson's Road, Millers Point, New South Wales? Thirty Hickson Road. Yes. And um, are you the General Manager Distribution of IWF Investment Management Limited? Correct. And you've held that position since 29 February 2016? Correct. All right. Now, do you appear today in answer to a summons dated 1 August 2018? I do. I tender that, Commissioner. Have we got the summons with you, uh, we have the Mr original Oliver? Exhibit 5.98, the summons to Mr Oliver. Mr. Mr Oliver, has a witness statement with exhibits been prepared for you? It has. And do you have the originals in the witness box with you? I do. Um, uh, and is the witness statement dated 26 July in respect of rubric 5.38? It is. And it's signed by you? It is. And is it true and correct? It is. I attend to that, Commissioner. Exhibit 5.99, the witness statement of Mr Oliver of 26 uh, July, together with its uh, annexures. Thank you, Mr Oliver. Yes, Mr Hodge. Thank you, Commissioner. Mr Oliver, you, as I understand it, started work at IOOF in, at the end of February of last year? 2016. Oh, the, I'm sorry, your statement says the 29th of February. Was it the 26th right. of February? 29th of February, 2016. Oh, I'm sorry, 29th of February, 2016. That's correct. I'm sorry. And the role of general manager distribution, who does that mean you report to? I report to the group general manager of wealth management. And who is that? That's Mr Renato Motta. And how does your role intersect with superannuation and in particular IML, the trustee? So my areas of responsibility include um, sales, which amongst other products and services include the products and services of IML as responsible entity. Um, my product teams also uh, constitute the products uh, which IML as responsible entity uh, for which you know, is a responsible entity. So I just want to try to help the Commissioner to understand the particular structure that IOOF has. IOOF is the holding company for the group. Uh, IOOF Holdings Limited is? Is the holding company for the group. It's a publicly listed company. It owns a company which is referred to as IML. Yes. And that's yeah, I think you'll need to help the transcriber, Mr Hodge. We've got someone trying very hard to keep up with acronyms. Yes. She's Emil had a long day. Is double I M L. Yes. And IML is an abbreviation for IOOF Investment Management Limited. Correct. And IML is the RSE licensee for a superannuation fund. That's correct. And IML is also 
the responsible entity for a number of managed investment schemes. That is also correct. And IML, as RSE licensee for the super fund, invests in the managed investment schemes that it operates as responsible entity. Among others, yes. It also invests in some other external Many managed other investment external schemes. Many investments, yes. The IML managed investment schemes are the largest investments by the IML superannuation fund? Uh, I don't believe that to be correct. Oh, you don't I, think I, that's right? Do you I think I there's a... I believe the largest single investment may be a third party fund manager. I'm sorry, you're going to have to keep your up. voice up, Mr. Oliver. I, I believe the largest single holding, I, I may be corrected, uh, is a third party. I see. And this structure of IML as both RSE licensee and RE for managed investment schemes, that's also a structure that was used for another entity that was owned by IOOF called Questor? Um, I, it was before my time, so I, I can't confirm or deny that to be the case. Questor had been effectively both the managed investment schemes that Questor was operating and the superannuation fund that Questor was operating were no longer being operated by Questor by the time you joined IOOF? Uh, I believe the successor fund tra transfer happened close after I joined. But, okay. uh, yeah. Could, again, I, I think you probably just need to, the it's a bit unusual, a lot of witnesses find it challenging, but you just need to speak a bit more loudly. Thank you. Now, you've responded to a number of questions that the Commission has asked about the operation of the superannuation business? Yes. And to go back to your role in the superannuation business, you have a sales team, is that right? I have uh, sales teams who... No, go uh, on. And what do the sales teams do? Um, broadly, uh, they represent the products and services across the group. Um, those products and services include the services of IML as a superannuation entity, but also the products and services of third party providers. We also provide uh, trustee services under the brand of Australian Executive Trustees. And my sales teams and relationship teams represent that broad set of capabilities. And one of the things then that you would do is to sell the superannuation fund to somebody? We promote the superannuation fund along other, along with others. And to whom do you promote the superannuation fund? Uh, the principal channels are um, to employers um, in respect of corporate superannuation and through financial advisors, and they're the principal two channels. Right, so you would promote use of the IML superannuation fund to financial advisors? Yes. And is that only financial advisors who are authorised representatives of licensees affiliated with the IOOF group, or is uh, that...? No, no, it's not. Um, so the cohort of advisors who are not AFSLs of the group, we would refer to as open market or independently financial, independent financial advisors. Now, when you were describing the role you have, I thought in addition to sales, you said you had another responsibility. Could also you responsible for the product team. Uh, and is the product team the team that designs the product that are the products that are issued by IML? They design and maintain the products provided by IML uh, and also maintain relationships with third party providers. Um, if I could just elaborate, uh, we're somewhat unique as a diversified financials organisation in that we offer the products and services of other platform providers and superannuation providers to financial advisors. You offer the products of other, prov of other platform providers, do yes. you say? To license, to, I'm sorry, to authorised representatives? Yeah, for sales. 
right, to the licensees, whether they're affiliated with the group or otherwise. Yes. And how does that work? You ask an AFSL licensee to use a platform that isn't the platform operated by IWF? Uh, we offer choice. So um, it may not, it may be the case that in, in, in not in not all circumstances, the product, the proprietary product that we offer is a viable solution for a financial advisor to offer to their customers. So the ability to offer choice across a range of solutions, we think is, is, is attractive for financial advisors. Can we bring up page 15 of your statement, which is the page ending, it's ifl.quadruple9.0003.0062. Now, you don't sit on the board of the RSE licensee? That's correct. Do you occasionally attend meetings of the board of the RSE licensee? Uh, on occasion, I will make a presentation or prepare papers for it. And what sort of matters would you report on to the board? Uh, broadly, when we're making a change to the nature of the superannuation fund, uh, in preparation to make that change and the approval or consideration by the board, uh, either myself or my team will prepare a paper. What sort of change? Could you give us an example of one change that you've dealt with um, recently? Well, for example, if we go back to the successor fund transfer, a lot of the paperwork whereby the trustees of both Questor and IMO consider that successor fund transfer, a lot of the the uh, materials to support that decision were produced from within my teams, for the product team, for example. Was produced by your product team, is that right? That's correct. Okay. And would you be involved in governance issues in relation to the <coughs> RSE licensee? Uh, yes, in a number of ways. Um, I, I see, uh, as a member of the organisation, I feel I have a governance obligation on behalf of members generally. Um, and specifically in respect to my membership of the Product Investment Committee, which is a delegated group of the ML Board, uh, which is charged with overseeing investment governance for the fund. Okay. You're not involved in the consideration being undertaken by ML as to changing its structure? Uh, not directly, no. You have, though, attempted to give some evidence about that? Uh, yes, I've relied on input from others to answer the questions in my statement. Okay, well, we, what we might try to do is to understand how much of this comes from your direct knowledge. You see question 13 that was asked was about any consideration given by the RSE licensee, that's IML, at any time since 1 January 2013 as to whether the payment of commissions from the assets of the fund is in the best interests of members? Yes. Have you ever been involved in any consideration by the RSE licensee of that issue? Uh, I have not been involved with consideration by the RSE board with respect to that conversation, uh, to that matter, no. And in order to answer this question, bearing in mind that, as I understand it, A, your role wouldn't involve consideration of this issue anyway, is that fair? That's fair. Yep. And B, you've only been at the company since the 29th of February 2016. Yes. How did you go about answering this question? Um, well, I've relied on the input of others, um, but I would also acknowledge the extent that the board would consider this area, they may have required input from my teams. I'm sorry, say that again? Um, I, I also consider it from the perspective that if the board was to consider this matter, they would have relied on some input from my product team in particular. If the board had considered removing commissions, 
you think they would have needed to have relied upon some input from your team? I would have anticipated that too, yes. And the part of the team that you're referring to is the part of the team that designs the products? That's right, the product team. And what would the relevance of the product team be to the question of whether commissions should cease? Um, well, I, I, I would have anticipated that to understand um, the extent to which commissions existed within the product, they would be the natural place to go to establish that information. Okay. Commissions do exist within Emil's Superfund? Uh, yes. And do commissions also exist within Emil's managed investment schemes? Uh, not to the best of my knowledge. Okay, so it's just the super fund. If a member is invested in the Immel super fund and assuming that the grandfathering, grandfathering provisions of FOFA apply, there will be commissions paid. Uh, I believe there are as well. I, I know that there is a small amount and in closed products. In closed products. That's right. Okay. And are you involved in the acquisition of the One Path business by IOOF? Uh, yes, I am. Do you know how commissions are to be dealt with in relation to the acquisition of the One Path business? I do not. Okay. In answer to the question that I read out before, I'm just trying to understand if the answer is this has never been considered by the RSC licensee. You seem to have given a different answer. You say, in the lead up to the implementation of the FOFA reforms, IMOL considered the impact on members of the new requirements on superannuation products, including the grandfathering of pre-existing commission arrangements. See that? Yes. So did you speak to somebody who told you that the continuation of commissions had been considered by the RSE licensee before 1 July 2013? Uh, yes, that's been the input I was provided because clearly I wasn't there at the time. And who did you speak to? Uh, that was our legal counsel, internal legal counsel. And he told you it had been considered? Yeah, to the extent it had been considered, it was described as that. Sorry, I'm not sure I understand. Your statement says, in the lead up to the implementation of the FOFA reforms on 1 July 2013, IMOL considered the impact on members of the new requirements on superannuation products, including the grandfathering of pre-existing commission arrangements. Yes. I th think I do understand. What you're saying is, you've been told, in the lead up to FOFA taking effect, IMOL considered what the effect would be on members of the new requirements for superannuation products and the limit of the consideration in relation to commission was that pre-existing commission arrangements could be grandfathered uh, uh, yes and further as i understand it and as i've described it there also uh, was a consideration to ensure that members could move to a product which did not comprise of those features from that point forward. There was consideration given to whether it would be possible for members to move to a non-commissioned product? Uh, again, I, I, I understand it to be the case that the primary consideration of grandfathered commissions at that time was to ensure that um, unbundled or more contemporary products were available to members from the point of the 1st of July 2013 onward. I see. And do you know who it was that undertook that consideration? Uh, I don't. So, again, this is just something that the, do you say the legal counsel or the general counsel? Uh, our legal counsel, our senior legal counsel. Told you that the consideration was it should be possible for a member in a commission product to move to a non-commission product. Yes. Why would it be anything other than possible? And I think my 
point was, and if it's not been made clear, is that the consideration at that time was to ensure that members could move to a similar product without those um, trail commissions embedded. By ensure, do you know what you mean? Um, well, uh, that there would be no artificial barrier for a member to be able to move to an equivalent product to that which was grandfathered. Do you mean your understanding is the limit of the extent to which IMOL has ever considered whether it's in the best interests of members to keep paying commission is that IMOL considered but decided not to erect artificial barriers to being able to move from a commissioned product to a non-commissioned product? Um, I, I wouldn't put it in those terms. The, the idea was that we would give members the freedom to move and make a decision that way. But don't members have that freedom? Um, well, again, uh, I believe so, yes. But there were a number of products which had to be closed. So to ensure that we had equivalent range of products. They had to be closed to, to new members. That's right. Because they had built-in commissions. Yes. And Immel opened equivalent products that didn't have built-in commissions. That's correct. So that it could accept new members into those products. Yes. And comply with the law. That's correct. Is that... Is there some other action that you're aware of Immel having taken to ensure that members could move from a commission product to a non-commission product? Uh, not that I'm aware of. And in answer to the question that was posed by the commission, has Immel considered whether it's in the best interests of members for the payment of commissions, or I'm sorry, whether the payment of commissions from the assets of funds is in the best interests of members? Is the answer to that question no? Uh, I believe that that is correct. Okay, but again, you're wholly dependent on what you've been told. Yes. By the legal counsel, senior legal counsel at IWO. Or, or subsequently learn from board. Or what, sorry? Or subsequently learn from what may have been discussed at board. H have you learned anything no. relevant to this question from the board? No. Okay. Is that a convenient time, Commissioner? Yes. Thank you. 9.30 tomorrow, Mr Hodge. Thank you, Commissioner. Yes, Mr Hodge. Commissioner Wickens. Continuing with Mr. Oliver. Mr. Oliver, would you come back to the witness box, please? Yes. Thank you. Can we bring up IFL quadruple nine dot triple zero three dot zero zero six four? This is page seventeen of Mr. Oliver's witness statement. Yes. Now, and if we bring up paragraph 40, Mr Oliver, you were asked some questions by the Commission about the position of IMOL, which is the trustee, as to whether it should receive the benefit of payments made by responsible entities of managed investment schemes that were paid to the group where the payments were in respect of investments of the superannuation funds. You're aware of that? Yes. And just if we make sure the structure of this is clear, you talked already yesterday about how IMOL, as the trustee of the superannuation fund, will invest some of its money in managed investment schemes that are operated by IMOL again, but this time as responsible entity. That's correct. And then IMOL, as the responsible entity of those managed investment schemes, will in turn invest that money with external managed investment schemes. Uh, yes. And 
there are agreements, many agreements, that the IOOF group has in place with external managed investment schemes by which they agree to make payments back to the IOOF group for investments made by IML as responsible entity of the managed investment schemes. Um, if I could perhaps clarify there. Yes. Um, so IML as a responsible entity uh, operates managed investment schemes, which in the majority then invest with other fund managers on a wholesale basis. Um, this particular question I interpret to relate to the broad investment menu that uh, the platform operator offers members of the fund access to a range of direct other managers' managed investment schemes. Yes. Um, so there are two different ways of accessing, if you like, third-party fund managers. One indirectly through a managed investment scheme operated by IML, yes. known as the multi-mix fund, or more directly on a platform menu operated by the, the RE, by the RSE, into those fund manager options. And that's what those um, uh, relationships relate to, the latter. Sorry, when you're saying those relationships and you're pointing at the paper, you mean the question? That we're in relation to managed investment schemes whereby IFL receives a payment. Yes. I, and when you're saying IFL, you're referring to the head group. Is that the right? holding company, yes. And perhaps to, maybe if we can try to orient this, can we bring up one of these agreements? Can we bring up IFL.0009.0001.0007? So this is what's described as a fund manager deed? Um, a platform services agreement, yes. And it's an agreement between IOOF Holdings, the holding company? That's correct. And Aberdeen Asset Manager, which is an external fund manager? That's correct, yes. And is this an agreement you're familiar with? Uh, not directly, no. The it's, is it a type of agreement that you're familiar with? Uh, yes, I'm aware of the construct. Yeah. Okay, and the, when you talk about the construct, perhaps if we go to page dot zero zero two three. So this sets out certain IOOF related entities. Yes. And we see one of them is Australian Executive Trustees or AET. That's correct. And another is IOOF Investment Management, which is IML. That's right. And a third is Questor Financial Services. Yes. And Questor is no longer in operation. That's correct. And the way that this type of agreement works is that these related entities each operate platforms for IOOF? Yes. And superannuation members can invest their money through the platforms operated by IOOF? Uh, yes, some or all of those platforms operate a superannuation fund. Sorry, you'll have to repeat that. Uh, some or all of those platforms operate or operated a superannuation fund, yes. And then from those platforms, there are then investments into external managed investment schemes such as ones operated by Aberdeen? Yes. And under this agreement, Aberdeen agrees to make payments to IOOF, the holding company, in exchange for investments made through the subsidiary platform operators. Yes, it's in return for the, uh, if you like, the administration of uh, contributions and distributions and all of the um, operations that are required to, for money to flow through to that fund manager's managed investment scheme. And for agreements like this that were entered into before 1 July 2013, they require 
a percentage of the funds under management to be paid back to the holding company? Um, it is my understanding that prior to 1 July 13, it was a value-based payment, yes. Sorry, you, again, could I ask you to do two things? The first is just to speak up yep. a little bit. And the second is, if you could just try to listen to my question and see whether you can answer my question. It's a bit tricky sometimes when you insert some jargon into it for us to understand whether we're agreeing with each other. So the way in which the payment from an external fund manager back to the holding company is determined under pre-1 July 2013 agreements is by a percentage of the funds invested from the IOOF platforms into the external fund manager? I believe that's correct at that time. Well, those agreements continue to apply now, don't they? I believe the basis upon which any payment is made is on the basis of um, number of members. Sorry, you think that all of the agreements have been changed now to number of members? Uh, it's my understanding that the basis upon which these fund manager payments are made is on a per member basis. I, and I wonder whether we're at cross purposes here. For new agreements entered into after 1 July 2013, those agreements are on a per member basis. Uh, that would be correct, yes. Because FOFA banned, except in certain circumstances, volume-based shelf fees. That's correct. For agreements entered into before 1 July 2013, they still contain percentages? Um, I don't know, to be honest. Is this not part of what you are responsible for as part of products and platforms? Uh, it is, but I'm not familiar with those arrangements prior to that date. The, the arrangements, though, continue to operate, don't they, Mr Oliver? I believe they do, yes. So the arrangements from pre-1 July 2013 <coughs> continue to apply now? Uh, that may be the case. I'm not entirely sure. When you came to answer the questions that the Commission asked you about payments from responsible entities of MISs, did you make any inquiries to understand how this part of the business you were responsible for operated? Yes, I did. Did you make any inquiries to understand, as an example, why there were some fund managers who were paying very substantial amounts of money per quarter and some fund managers paying a much lower amount of money? Um, I didn't ask that particular question. My assumption was that it was based on the popularity of those particular funds. So just so I understand, you think that all payments now made by external managed investment schemes are made on the basis of the number of members invested in the external fund rather than on the basis of a percentage? Uh, that's been my understanding, yes. And for agreements entered into after 1 July 2013, the amount paid per member is $10 per member? That's correct. How was that arrived at? Um, I, I, I don't recall. Well, I wasn't around at the time that, that amount was set. I understand. Well, again, this forms part of the section that you're responsible for. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. And you know that new fund managers who sign up to have a product listed on an IOOF platform have to pay $10 per member? Yes. Do you know how that $10 was arrived at? Um, I, I don't know the basis upon which that number was arrived at, but I know what it covers, and it sounds a reasonable <laughs> level based on the operations that are required to facilitate an investor into those funds. I'm sorry, could you say that again? I don't know the precise basis upon which that number was arrived at, but I understand the um, processes that have to be undertaken, and I, my understanding is a recovery of that process cost. And who is it that incurs that process cost? 
Um, it would be the service co in this particular instance, so IWF Services, which is the majority employer of staff um, that operate the administration of these flows. And is it your evidence that the payments are made to the holding company but then paid back to Service Co? Uh, it's paid back to the platform operator. Your evidence then, as I understand it, it would be money gets invested by IML as the responsible entity into an external managed investment scheme, like one run by Aberdeen. That's the first step. Yes. And then Aberdeen makes a payment to IOOF Holdings in respect of that investment. Um, so the actual steps, as I understand it, are um, a member's money comes in through uh, IML as responsible entity. It's paid through to the custodian who then disperses uh, monies through to a range of managed investment schemes, term deposits and a range of other investments. So it's the custodian that actually um, directs those payments. There's a custodian in, dis yes. in between the IML managed investment scheme and the external managed investment scheme? Uh, and between the RE and the operation of the fund. The RSE. And between IML and yes. the actual fund that IML is the responsible entity for? Yes. In any event, money has moved from the fund that IML is operating out into an external managed investment scheme? Yes. And then the external managed investment scheme has made a payment to IOOF Holdings for receiving that money or it being invested with that external managed investment scheme? Um, so the payment is in respect of the uh, provision of access prov uh, and the administration of that flow and subsequent uh, income distribution payments that come back from the fund manager. Uh, and tax reporting and, and aggregation of tax and those activities. And the total amounts of those payments each quarter are quite substantial? Yes, I think they're shown in the uh, annex show. But let's bring that up. I tender that document, Commissioner. Fund manager deed, IWF Holdings and Aberdeen Asset Management Limited, IFL 0009, 001, 007, Exhibit 5.100. We can bring up Annexia D to Mr Oliver's statement, which is IFL quadruple nine dot triple zero three dot zero zero eight three. So this is the first of four pages of payments made by various REs back to IWF Holdings. That's correct. Yeah. And this, these are payments just for the quarter ended March 2018, is That's that right? That's correct, yes. And so we see the first one, Aberdeen, is paying $136,743.92 that relates just to the superannuation fund back to IOOF Holdings. That's correct. And that's as a proportion, or that's as part of a total payment made by Aberdeen back to IOOF Holdings of $182,392.37. Yes. And again, this is per quarter. That's correct. Now you see then the next item, the next line item is Alliance Bernstein. Alliance Bernstein, yes. And that payment is of a much smaller amount. Yes. And similarly you see Ascalon Capital Managers Limited. Yes. And that's paying just $1,250 per quarter. Yes. And $1,250 per quarter is the minimum payment 
that can be made to a fund manager back to IOOF Holdings. Is that right? I believe there's a yeah a, a per fund minimum charge. Yeah. And can I suggest that some of these external fund managers are paying on the basis of ten dollars per member, and some of them are paying on the basis of a percentage of funds under management. Uh, based on my earlier comments, that's possible. Yes. Okay. Um, could I could I make a further comment? Yes. Um, if I look at the disparity in those numbers, um, I would point to the fact that some of these fund managers will operate multiple managed investment schemes of varying degrees of popularity amongst members, um, which would go some way to explain the discrepancy between those numbers. Yes, well, if I take you back to the amendment made to the Aberdeen Agreement on the 25th of June 2013. Can we bring up IFL.0009.0001.0001? So this is an amendment made to the Aberdeen Agreement. You can see it's dated the 25th of June 2013. Yes. And if we go over the page to dot triple zero two. You can see it's been signed on the 25th of June, so five days before BOFA comes into effect. Yes. And then if we go over the page to dot triple zero three, and we see this is a list of the funds presently being operated by Aberdeen. Do you agree? Oh, I'm sorry, operated at the time, that is as of the yes. 25th of June, and the management fee that's to be paid back to the holding company is a percentage of the funds that are invested. Yes. And do you have any reason to think that this agreement with the percentage has since been superseded? Uh, I'm not aware of that being so. I'm sorry, say that again. I'm not aware of that being the case. Okay. And do you say that these percentages genuinely reflect the cost to IOOF Service Co of providing whatever services it provides to Aberdeen? Um, I, there are a level which was agreed at the time. I can't comment further than that. Well, what happened was this, wasn't it? For from one July two thousand and thirteen, it was prohibited to make volume-based shelf space payments back to a fund manager or a platform operator like IOOF, except insofar as it reflected the actual cost of or efficiencies. Is that your understanding? Yeah, that sounds right. And. These are what would be referred to as grandfathered payments. That sounds right, yeah. Do you know whether that's the case, Mr Oliver? Uh, not definitively, no. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a level of detail that predated my joining the firm and familiarity with those arrangements. What I'm trying to understand is, if we go back to your statement, when you gave evidence If we go back to IFL.9.0003.0064, I'm sorry, Commissioner, I should tender that amendment document. Amendment to Aberdeen Agreement, 25 June 13, uh, IFL 0009 0001 0001 is Exhibit 5.101. Thank you, Commissioner. So you've given evidence here in respect to our questions. In paragraph 40, that Imil's position is it should only receive the payments if it provides services to the responsible entities? Yes. Now, when you've said that's Imil's position, how did you determine that that was Imil's position? Uh, well, Imil, as the uh, superannuation entity, doesn't deliver those services. The services are delivered through the platform operators. 
which have a service agreement with Emil. When you said that that was Emil's position, how did you determine what Emil's position was? Uh, by working with my colleagues to establish what Emil's position was as responsible as responsible superannuation entity. So which colleagues did you work with to figure out what Emil's position was? Um, well, working across the business with my product colleagues, with my um, governance and legal colleagues to understand the uh, background to the contractual arrangements between the parties. Was this something that, to your knowledge, was ever considered at the board level of Emil? Um, I, I'm, I'm not aware of that. Do you understand that ultimately it is the board that determines the position of Emil about anything that the board might wish to determine the position about and delegates it to others to determine the position about things that are delegated to them? Um, yes, I do. Do you know whether the Emil board has delegated to somebody to determine what its position is about payments from external managed investment schemes? Um, to the extent that Emil's board um, uses the services of our legal team. Um, I interpreted that to be a suitable proxy for Emil's position. Is the reason you say that because this paragraph was something that was drafted by IOOF's legal team? Um, this was a paragraph which was drafted between us to ensure that it reflected the arrangement that exists. I'm sorry, to ensure that it what? That it reflected the arrangement that exists. Can I suggest this to you? That as far as you are aware, Imel at a board level has never considered what its position is with respect to payments made by external managed investment schemes to the IOOF group where those payments are derived based on investment of the superannuation funds? Um, I, I can confirm that I'm not privy to the board's deliberations on these matters. You don't know whether the board has considered I this? I don't know directly that that's something that has been discussed. And when this paragraph was drafted to say what the position was of Emil, this wasn't based on going back and finding some record of this issue having been considered at an earlier point in time? Uh, not to my knowledge, no. This was just something that you and the legal team came up with to describe what you decided was the position? Um, I have no reason to believe that that's an incorrect statement. But do you have any reason to believe that it's a correct statement? Uh, well, I, I trust my colleagues and my uh, governance department. They work closely with the board. So it's somebody in the governance department that told you that this was the case? Yeah. Well, it's working between the governance area and my product team to ensure that's an accurate statement. Who told you that this was the position of Emil? Um, this was working with my legal counsel and other colleagues to ensure that it was a, a, a true statement. Did somebody say this is the position of Emil? Um, well, ultimately, yes. Who was that? that? That would be from our legal counsel. And who is the legal counsel? Um, this is Mr. Mark Mittelman, working with our company secretary. And then you see in paragraph 44, it said, IFL passes on the payment from each of the responsible entities of the MISs to the platform operator? Yes. Now, the platform operator is Emil. Uh, in some instances, that's Emil as responsible entity, yes. Are there other platform operators within uh, the group? Yes, as, as listed in the prior um, item, Australian Executive Trustees and previously Questor. Questor doesn't exist anymore? That's correct, yeah. So it's only Australian Executive Trustees and Emil? That's correct. And is it your understanding that IFL pays money or passes on to Emil as the platform operator the monies that it receives from external managed investment schemes? I believe so, yes. And what is the basis for your belief? Um, well, I've, I've been, that's what I've been given to believe. I have no reason to disbelieve that. Yes, perhaps I should put it a different way. Who told you that this was the case? Um, 
to be honest, I, I, I don't recall specifically as we were bringing my responses together for this statement. Sorry, you don't recall? I don't recall. Who specifically told you this? No. Have you reviewed the financial statements for, for example, EMIL or IOOF? No, I have not. Can I bring those up? This is for the financial year ending 30 June 2017, which is IFL.0060.0003.3737. Now, if we go to page dot three seven six five you see there's note thirty a third of the way down the page related party transactions yes and you see There's a, then a subheading which is transactions with related parties. Yes. Do you agree, as is stated there, that Emil is a related party to IFL? Yes. IFL being the holding company? Yes. And you see other income? Yes. And you see investment manager fees received from related entity? Yes. Now, in 2017, that payment received from a related entity was only $154,500. See that, yes. That couldn't possibly be the payment back to Immel of the investment management, or I'm sorry, of the fees received from external managed investment schemes. I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with these statements, but... You're not yeah. familiar with the financial statements of Immel? No, I'm not. Can I put it to you in a different way? Do you agree that the payments received by IFL from external managed investment schemes in respect of monies invested from IML platforms vastly exceeds $154,500 in a single year? Um, it certainly doesn't reflect what is in the uh, annex sure. In the annex sure to yeah. your statement? Yes. It doesn't reflect your evidence? Um, well. I don't know where it would be reflected. I, I'm not familiar with the statements. And you see then other transactions? Yes. And those are all payments to related entities rather than payments from related entities? I, I, can't, I can't tell that from what I can see, but... You can't tell that. It says... Service and marketing fees paid to related, two related yes, entities. Yes. Investment manager fees paid to related entities. Retail yes. management fees paid to related entities. Services yes. fees paid to related entity. Yes. So do we agree those are payments made to related entities? Yes. Attend to that document, Commissioner. Emil Financial Report, 30 June 17, IFL 0006 0003 3737, Exhibit 5.102. So if we come back to paragraph 44 of your statement, which is IFL.9.0003.0064, do you still wish to maintain that IFL passes on the payment from each of the responsible entities of the MISs to the platform operator? Um, I do because I, I, I don't understand the connection between the statements and uh, that you've shown me. And if the payments were received by IML, you would expect them to be recorded in the financial statements? Right. Do you agree? Yes. If they're not recorded in the financial statements, that would suggest that the first sentence of paragraph four, 44 of your statement is untrue.
But were the financial statements not of MO rather than IFL that you showed me? That's right. We looked at the financial statements of IMO. Yes. IMO is the platform operator. Right. Isn't it? Yes, I believe so, yes. So if IMO received a payment from IFL, no. it would be recorded in its financial statements. Um, yeah, I would expect so. This paragraph, again, is just based on something that somebody told you. Um, yeah, and I believe to be the case. And who told you? Um, as I've explained, were my government services colleagues. And do you believe it to be the case for any reason other than somebody told you? Um, no. I'm sorry? No. All right. Can we move to a different topic? I'm sorry, I should actually, in fairness, ask you this, Mr Oliver, seeing as you purported to give evidence about it. One of the things that we are trying to understand is how trustees go about dealing with these types of grandfathered volume-based shelf space fees where a percentage of the investments that are being made of the trust's money are being paid to other parts of a particular retail group. You understand the issue? Yes. If I ask you questions about that, is that going to be of any assistance to the Commissioner? Uh, I'm, not going to, I'm not sure I understand the question, sorry. You've purported to give evidence about this issue. Yes. Do you have any knowledge beyond what is set out in the five paragraphs that we have looked at on page 17 of your statement about this issue? Um, I have general knowledge around it. But... All right. Can you see an issue from the perspective of the trustee, which is that another part of the retail group is receiving a percentage of the funds of the trust invested with an external managed investment scheme. I can see that, yes. And can you see that for a trustee, a trustee acting in the best interests of members would, one would expect, say that money should not go to some other part of the group except insofar as it reflects a payment for services, it should be returned to the members? Um, I, I agree that with, with your statement that it should go to the service provider of the service. But only yes. to the extent that the service provider is providing some service worth the value of the money? Yes. And so if the payment that is being made is a percentage of the funds invested, unlinked from the value of the services provided, then it is entirely possible that the payment made by the external managed investment scheme will vastly exceed the value of any services provided. Um, I, I, I can't comment on that, but I can see the line of question, yes. And in those circumstances, you can see that the trustee would say, this isn't money that should be retained by some other part of the retail group. It should be returned to the members because it is a percentage of their funds. Um, if the proposition is that that amount exceeds the uh, reasonable level of services provided, I would agree. And is that something, to your knowledge, that has been considered within IOOF? Um, I, I, I can't speak for the conversations within the board. You're aware that there's another agreement between IML and IOOF Holdings, which is of this same type of agreement? Um, other than that, which we've just discussed. A, a platform services agreement between yes. IML and IOOF. Yes. 
would it assist you if I brought it up? It's IFL.0009.0001.0018. So this is a platform services agreement between Holdings and Emil. You see that? Yes. Are you familiar with this agreement? I'm aware of it. I'm not. Do you, are you aware of why it was entered into? Um, well, because the uh, because of the services delivered to the organisation. I'm sorry, because of the services delivered to the organisation. Yep. Did you say? Yes. So, if we go to page 14 of this document, dot one one three one. So the related entities here are Australian Executor Trustees and IML. Yes. And the services that are provided, if we go to page 21, which is dot one one three eight. is fund administration and, in, and additional investment related services provided by IFL's related entities? Yes. So the IFL related entities as we've seen are A AET and IML? Yes. So just so I understand, this is an agreement whereby IML agrees with holdings that IML will pay holdings for services that IML provides to itself. Yes, that appears to be the case. And do you know how in practice that agreement works? Uh, no, I don't. Right. I tender that document, Commissioner. Platform Services Agreement, IWF Holdings and IML, uh, IFL 0009, 0001, 18, Exhibit 5.103. Mr Hodge, have we got a date for that agreement? Uh, yes, Commissioner. It's the, from memory, it's the 28th of March, 2018. That 28th date. of March, 2018. Yes. Yes. The date should be part of the exhibit marking. Thank you, Commissioner. Then can we bring back up Mr Oliver's statement and go to IFL.9.0003.0071? So you see question 29 that the Commission asked you was summarise any concerns raised by APRA since 1 January 2013 with the RSE licensee, which is IML, or the group, concerning the governance arrangements of the RSE licensee or the relationship between the RSE licensee and the group. Explain how, if at all, the RSE licensee has addressed any such concerns. Yes. And you see in paragraph 67, your answer is, during the APRA industry-wide review that commenced in late 2016 that focused on governance issues, APRA raised certain matters in respect of the governance arrangements of IML or its relationship with the group? Yes. And then you say, until this APRA review, no material concerns had been raised by APRA in respect of IML since 1 January 2013? Yes. What was the basis upon which you made that statement? Uh, well, I, I had to rely on the input of others, given I joined the firm in, in 2016. Um, so the council was sought from our company secretary who would be close to these matters. All right, so you spoke to the company, sec company secretary. Who is that? That's Mr Paul Vine. And the company secretary told you that the first time APRA raised any issues in respect of EMIL was as part of the industry-wide review that commenced in late 2016. I believe that to be the case. Can I show you APRA.0002.0003.1363?
Can I ask you, before I ask you some questions about the detail of this document, are you familiar with how APRA supervises the operation of the IOOF group or IML? Um, broadly, um, in terms of regular interactions, quarterly meetings, um, but beyond that, I'm not privy to the specifics of how that monitoring takes place. Okay. So you see, this is a letter to the director of IOOF hold the directors of IOOF Holdings Limited, dated the fifteenth of September two thousand and fifteen. You see that at the top. Yes. I take it this wasn't a document that you were shown in the course of preparing to give evidence. Uh, that's correct. And you see that the subject of the document is the holdings company Immel and Questor. Yes. And that they are referred to collectively as IOOF. Yes. And if we go over to page four of the document, which is dot one three six six. If we look under the heading of changes to APRA's supervision program, you see the second paragraph there. APRA noted that it had been interacting with IOOF on a wide range of prudential matters, many of which had been discussed during the meeting. In particular, of concern to APRA had been the difficulty in obtaining accurate and current information in relation to the ILs. Is that, that's the holding company. IOOF Limited. Rather than IFL. ILs, Chief Risk Officer role, portability relief, the ORFR, culture, identification of responsible persons, the information flow and relationship between the board and management and the Fairfax media matter? Yes. And then the next paragraph, given the size and complexity of IOOF, the number and range of prudential matters raised raises concerns for APRA. As a result, the approach being taken is to move away from focusing on each individual issue and focusing on understanding management's interactions with the IML, Questor and IOOF boards and the overall culture of IOOF? Yes. Now, I've obviously only shown you a few parts of a letter that nobody in the group had made you aware of before now. Do you still maintain that the first time that APRA raised matters in respect of governance arrangements was in about late 2016 as part of an industry-wide review? Um, I mean, if I reflect on that and the comments made, um, I, I understand there had been a regular ongoing dialogue around board structures, but again, those were being progressed. I think there was no material specific matters as I understand it. I tend to that document, Commissioner. Letter APRA to IWF Holdings, 15 September 15, APRA 0002, 0003, 1363, Exhibit 5.104. We bring up APRA.0002.0003.1361. So this is a letter from APRA to IOOF dated the 20th of October 2015. You see that? Yes. Again, this isn't a document that you were shown in the course of preparing to give evidence. That's correct. And then if we go to page two of that document, you see there's a paragraph about a third of the way down the page which begins with respect to our statement regarding our experience with IOOF in obtaining accurate and current information. We acknowledge that we did not discuss this matter at our meeting. It is, however, APRA's experience that there have been numerous instances where there have been difficulties in obtaining accurate and current information. And then there's some examples given. Yes. Now, again, I appreciate I've only shown you part of the document, do you still think the statements in paragraph 67 of your statement are accurate? Uh, broadly, yes. I mean, I understand there is ongoing and will be ongoing dialogue. I think it's a question as to you know, the materiality of the concerns. Attend to that document, Commissioner. 
Letter APRA to IWF Holdings, 20 October 15, APRA 0002 0003-1361, Exhibit 5.105. And then can we bring up APRA.0002.0009.1213? So you'll see this is a letter dated the 21st of December 2015 to the directors of IWF Holdings. Yes. I take it again, this isn't a letter that you were shown during the course of preparing to give evidence? That's correct. And you'll recall, if we can put that document on one side of the page, of one side of the screen and bring up on the other side of the screen the relevant part of your statement, which is at ifl.quadruple9.0003.0071. So you see you say specifically that during the APRA industry-wide review that commenced in late 2016 that focused on governance issues, APRA raised certain matters in respect of the governance arrangements? Yes. And until that review, no material concerns had been raised? Yes. And then if we go to, on the left-hand side of the screen, page five of the document, dot one two one eight. See the heading governance? Yes. And then you see the second paragraph, APRA is concerned that the current governance structure has resulted in a lack of demonstrable focus by boards on individual APRA regulated entities as some decisions appear to have favoured the interests of shareholders over the beneficiaries of superannuation funds under trusteeship. Yes. Now again, I appreciate I've only shown you part of a document but do you still maintain that paragraph 67 of your statement is true? Uh, in, in light of that information, um, clearly there were concerns that were you know, different to that expressed. I tend to that document, Commissioner. Letter APRA to IWF Holdings, 21 December 15, APRA 0002 0009 1213, Exhibit 5.106. Why were you put up as the witness to deal with these questions, Mr Oliver? Um, well, in the main, uh, most of the questions relate to uh, the day-to-day -day areas of my responsibility. I see. Now, you know the Commission, after it received your statement, suggested that you were not the appropriate witness to address these questions? I understand that, that was the case. And suggested that Mr Kelleher, the managing director, would be the appropriate person to address these questions? I also understand that. And nevertheless, IWF insisted that you were the best person to answer these questions? Yes. Now, do you know why you were told with respect to paragraph 67 that concerns hadn't been raised by APRA until part of an industry ride review in late 2016? Um, I, I can see no other reason than a degree of materiality. So the comment says no material concerns. I think that's really the question. I, I can see no reason why I wouldn't have been told something that was believed to be um, material. One of the things that has happened is that APRA has been insisting upon IMOL splitting its dual regulated RE RSE model? I understand that and I understand it's subsequently been considered. Yes, you say if we bring up page 25 of your statement at dot zero zero seven two. You explain at paragraph 71 what you've been, I'm sorry, I was going to say what you've been told. I, you explain at 71 what APRA considers to be the minimum changes required by EMIL? Yes. I assume you haven't been dealing with APRA? No, I have not. This is again something that somebody has told you? I have to rely on the input for, of others, yes. And in this case, who are the others who have told you? Um, this? this would have been from my governance area again. Okay. 
and sorry, the governance area is the it area is comprises, of comprises, you know, company secretary, legal, compliance and risk. And you say in 72, these APRA proposals will be considered by the IFL board at its meeting on the 1st of August, 2018? Yes. And the board met on the 1st of August, 2018? It did. And do you know what resolution was reached? Uh, I'm not privy to the board All right. output that day. Now, I want to ask you about one last topic, which is some changes that were made earlier in this year to pricing. Yes. And that, that squarely is within the ambit of what you know about. Yes. Because it was your team that was responsible for pricing changes. Yeah, for proposing the pricing changes, yes. Okay. And can we bring up IFL.0006.0001.426 I'm sorry dot four one nine six So this is the papers for a meeting of the Board of Directors of Emil on the twelfth of February two thousand and eighteen. Yes. And if we then go to page dot four two six zero This is a paper that was sent to the board dealing with some changes to pricing. Yes. And if we go to page two of that document, which is dot four two six one. We can see at the bottom it's a paper endorsed by you and approved by Mr. Kelleher. Yes. And there are a few different aspects to this, but one of the aspects of the pricing was that there was going to be a repricing in relation to certain superannuation products. Yes. And there was also going to be a rebranding where the names of those superannuation products was changed. Yes. And you see about halfway down the page there's a sentence which is, all existing member pricing will be grandfathered. Yes. There is an arbitrage risk that existing personal division members will move from grandfathered pricing to the new pricing. However, this is an existing risk and historically there has been very little arbitrage. Yes. And what that's referring to is the new pricing is in most respects lower than the old pricing. Correct. And so the risk is that the members might move to the new pricing and therefore pay a lower price? Um, there is a likelihood, yes. Well, there's a risk, but what you said to the board was it's a low risk. Um, there was an expectation it was already happening, um, but yes. What you'd said to the board was the effect of this is there's a low risk. Yes. And if we go over the page to page three, we can see, I think at the, in the table at the bottom half of the page, some of the changes to pricing. Yes. And so choice and pension members who are currently, who have balances of up to $250,000 and are presently paying a 0.85% fee will, depending upon whether they move to core or the full platform model, pay either 0.35% or 0.7%. Yes. And the difference between the core and the full is that the core gives access to the 24 internal IOOF managed investment scheme. That's correct. Yeah. And the full gives access to both those internal IOOF managed investment schemes and also external managed investment yes. schemes. All right. And then if we go over the page to page five, which is dot four two six four, we'll see this is the appendix B considering the conflicts of interest that might arise. 
And in yes. paragraph one, we see in this case, the fees proposed for personal members are being reduced, which on its face demonstrates prioritisation of the interests of those members above the corporate interests. Yes. The complex issue doesn't seem to address the issue of grandfathering the higher pricing for existing members. Uh, no. Did you say no? No. Could I tender that document, Commissioner? Board papers for meeting of directors of ML 12 February 18, IFL 0006 0014196, Exhibit 4.107. Thank you. Now, you didn't attend that board meeting? Uh, no, I did not. But you received a report back later about an issue that had been raised? Uh, yes, from memory, there was a request by the board to ensure that uh, members were informed about the revised pricing going forward. Um, well, I think if we bring up IFL.0032.0001.0469, So this is an email sent by Renato Mota to you and to Mark Mittelman. Yes. And this is the day after the board meeting? Uh, yes. And the query that had been raised in respect of the repricing was why the new price point did not apply to all existing clients at trustees' discretion rather than just new clients or those that request a change? Yes. And then it said, in other words, is the trustee obliged to reprice or would it even be prudent to reprice all clients? Yes. And so that was then an issue that you needed to go and look at? Yes. Attend to that document, Commissioner. Email uh, motor to uh, Oliver and others, 13 February, 18 IFL 0032 0001 Exhibit 5.108. And if we bring up IFL 0032.0001.1243. This is a chain of emails that begins with an email sent by you, if we go to page dot one two four four. So this is very shortly after you've received Mr. Motor's email. You send an email to some members of your team. Yes. And in relation to the repricing, we see Renato has posed the question to legal, but for consideration, why would we not reprice all members in IES and is the trustee obliged to do so or are they simply not so better off by so doing? Yes. And then if we go over the page to pay the first page, dot one, two, four, three, and we see the response you get from Mr. Mason at the bottom of the page is relevantly Repricing the back book in IES has an $8 million per annum revenue impact. Yes. There are many grandfather commission arrangements in the pre-FOFA back book. We didn't reprice the back book at 1 January 2014. Yes. And then he sends you another email a little later on, which says, had a quick look at our back book. There are approximately 40,000 <laughs> IES members who have a grandfathered commission. Yes. But of the 29,000 IES members who would be better off under the new pricing, approximately 20,000 have a grandfathered commission? Yes. Attend to that document, Commissioner. Emails between Oliver Mason and others, 13 February 18, uh, IFL 0032-001-1243, Exhibit 5.109. Now, I don't know whether you'll have seen the next document or not. Can we bring up IFL.0032.0001.0044? So this is an internal email from Mr. Mota to Ms. Broom and copied to Mr. Mittelman. Yes. And it sent 
a little over a month later on the 22nd of March. Yes. And you'll see in the second line it says, see attached comments from director on repurpose and reprice papers. They are challenging on grounds of community expectations. Yes. Is this an email you've seen before? Uh, no, it's not. Are you aware that there were some challenges raised by a director in respect of the March email papers? Uh, yes. And what were the challenges? Um, uh, in essence, um, it centred around the back book and repricing of the back book. I'll show you the attachment and you tell me if you've seen the attachment. It's IFL.0032.0001.0042. So this is some notes that seem to have been prepared by at least one director on the board. Have you seen it before? Uh, no, I haven't seen this. You see the fourth bullet point down, which is interests of beneficiaries must be prioritised over interests of the trustee. Surely it is in their interest to have the lower pricing and in the trustee's interest to keep them on the higher pricing. You see that? Yes. And you, you recognise, don't you, that conflict of interest, on the one hand, the interest of the beneficiaries, the members of the trust fund and have a lower pricing, and on the other hand, the interests of the trustee in ultimately making more profit that it can return to the group. I do recognise that conflict, yes. And do you consider that that conflict was at, I'm sorry, I tend to that document, Commissioner. Uh, with its uh, email, uh, Mr Hodge, the email motor to Broom and others, 22 March 18, uh, IFL 0032-001-0044, with its attachment, March uh, uh, Immel papers, IFL 0032-001-0042, together exhibit 5.110. Thank you, Commissioner. Do you consider that the conflict was adequately managed in this case, Mr Oliver? Uh, yes, I do. All right. Do you want to explain to the Commissioner how the conflict was managed? Um, well, I think we have, um, firstly, a recognition that a conflict exists. Uh, there was a subsequent set of requirements given by the Board to um, follow up those members who may be better off in the new pricing structure. And that's a process which we continue to go through today. I'm sorry, I'll... Could I ask you just to take that or explain that to us again? So the conflict was recognised? Yes. And then how was the conflict managed? Um, so the conflict's managed insofar as reassessing the fee, being comfortable with it, and then ensuring that those members who may benefit from moving to the new pricing are made aware of that. I see. So ultimately the change to the pricing was approved by the board? Yes. And you were saying but the board also approved notifying members who might benefit, who, well, in fact, would benefit from the new pricing about the new pricing. That's correct. I mean, all members were informed, but there was a follow-up program to ensure that those members who would most likely benefit from further awareness of the impact of those changes would be followed up. Well, I'll show you the paper, which is, if we go to IFL. Triple zero six dot triple zero one dot four six three six. So this then is the set of papers for the next meeting of the IML board on the twenty third of March two thousand and eighteen. Yes. And if we go to page dot four six five zero. This is a follow-up paper on the pricing strategy? Yes. And if we go to the second page, 
We see again the endorsement is by you and it's approved by Mr Kelleher. Yes. And then if we go back to the first page where there's the conflicts consideration. We see it says a thorough analysis was undertaken prior to the preparation of the February board paper to compare the current pricing available to all 58,562 existing choice members. Yes. Overall, 29,000 existing members currently have a higher fee structure and may potentially benefit under the new pricing, representing approximately 50% of existing choice members. Yes. And then it said 22,000 of these choice members are currently advised. Yes. And that, I think, means 22,000 of the 29,000. Uh, that sounds right. Or you're not sure? Uh, I, I'm not sure, to be honest, but given they're in choice, one would expect that they would be more likely to be advised. Well, this, is, this paragraph is only concerned with choice members. Yes. So it's either all of the choice members right, yeah, or right. the subset that are pay, have a higher fee structure. You're not sure which one it is? Uh, to be honest, it's not clear to me that, which way. And then if we go over the page, it said in the second paragraph, in this case, although the fees proposed for new choice members are being reduced, 50% of the existing choice members will have a higher fee structure than the proposed fee structure and will not be automatically moved across to the new pricing. It is common across the industry for platforms to have clients at different price points. Yes. And then it says, to manage this conflict, all choice members will be notified of the new product offering as outlined below. Yes. Now, this paper doesn't seem to explain how many of those members with a linked advisor are paying grandfathered commissions? No. Attend to that document, Commissioner. Board papers for meeting of Immel Board, 23 March 18, AFL 0006 0001 4636, Exhibit 5.111. Thank you. Now, I think the repricing doesn't actually get approved at that meeting. Um, this was March? Yes. Yeah. Um, I, I can't recall the precise timing, sorry. There's a, oh, I'm sorry. I think you're, I think I've misled you. I think it is approved at that meeting. I should, but then it's reported as part of the May meeting. So can we bring up the May meeting, which is IFL.0006.0001.5149? So this is the pack for the May meeting, but it contains the minutes for the March meeting, which are at page.5156. And if we go to page dot five one five seven, we see these are the parts of the minutes dealing with this employer super repricing. Yes. And you see the third bullet point down, there are potentially different perspectives on price. The proposed pricing benefits will be applied to current RSE members who can access them on request. Revised pricing cannot simply be applied across all RSE members as some would be worse off and it would not be financially viable for the business, which requires economic sustainability, as well as an ongoing approach to continuously improving services. Compared to competitors, we are top quartile in return and bottom quartile on fees. You see that? Yes. Now, and then it goes on to explain the changes to pricing will be communicated to financial advisors and members. Yes. Now, one of the things that Immel could have done was to apply the new pricing to those existing members who would be better off under the new pricing. Yes. But it didn't do that? Uh, no. And if we go over the page to dot 5158, we see the resolution, which is to approve the new pricing. Do 
Regional uh, Resolution 18-3-3.1? Yes. You didn't attend this board meeting? No, I did not. But we see what happens is that the rest of the board, which is the chairman, Mr. Van Andos, the managing director, Mr. Kelleher, Ms. Flynn and Mr. Selak, don't vote on this item because they're conflicted. And the only two directors who vote on the item are the two independent directors who have been appointed, Ms. Oldham and Mr. Walsh. Yes. And they end up voting, or well, they vote in favour of the repricing. Yes. Ultimately, there's reconsideration of some of these issues, although not the repricing, after complaints are made by Bridges financial planners? Um, that was in respect of a different product, uh, not the employer super product. Yes, yeah, so there's yes. a different issue not related to this yes. repricing of the employer product. That was, that, was that related to the pursuit? That's correct, product? yes. Now, one of the things that your team had considered in preparing this repricing was the likelihood that existing members would move over to the new pricing? Yes. And what was the conclusion that your team came to as to the likelihood that existing members would move over to the new pricing? Um, so are we talking about the uh, employer super reprice? Yes. Um, well, I mean, we, we have to, if we look at the overall economics of the product, we need to make certain modelling assumptions to be able to have confidence to set a price point. Um, so there was an expectation that, you know, certain member cohorts may not move, and we factored that into how we would arrive at the price. Attend to that document, Commissioner. Board papers meeting of Emerald Board, 30 May 18, IFL, triple zero six, triple zero one five one four nine, exhibit 5.112. Thank you, Commissioner. Now, I want to give you another opportunity to directly answer the question that I've asked. There was an assessment made of the likelihood that certain types of members would move over from the old pricing to the new pricing? Yes. And could you explain to the Commissioner what that assessment was? Um, there were certain probabilities of movement to price points. Um, that helps inform the economic impact of changing price downward. Um, and based on those judgments, that's what we set the price at. Can we bring up IFL.0010.0001.0160? This is a memo prepared to the IOOF leadership group by Ms Broom and Mr Mason. Yes. And they're within your team? They are, yes. And you'll see this is dated the 31st of January 2018? Yes. And who are the IOOF leadership team group? Um, that's the senior executives of the group, so the heads of each of the major functions. Would that include, does that include you? Uh, no, it doesn't. It includes the managing director, includes my manager and the other functional heads. All right, so it would go to Mr Kelleher? Yes. And if we go over the page to page four of that document, dot zero one six three. Actually, we'd just go to dot zero one six four. So we see three point five risks. Yes. So this is identifying the risks of the new pricing that's proposed. Yes. And then we look just below the look about a quarter of the way down the page, we see arbitrage risk, IES moving to new pricing. Yes. And the second dot point is 
29,263 would be better off. Yes. And that's a number ultimately reflected, as we've seen in that board paper that was presented in March. Yes. And 16,164 of these are advised with a grandfathered trail. Yes. That information doesn't seem to have been provided to the directors and in particular the independent directors in the March paper. I noticed that, yeah. Did you say you noticed that? I noticed that, yeah. And then you see the paragraph down. It can be seen that the arbitrage risk within IES is different from other reprices due to grandfathered commissions and unengaged membership with low account balances and a large number of members being only marginally better off. Yes. And then in the next paragraph, in reviewing arbitrage risk, we considered the unlikely movement of direct unadvised members and advised members with grandfathered trail. Yes. And the preparation of this paper, were you part of it? Um, I don't recall, but I, I would expect to have seen it, yes. And the first proposition seems to be that for members who are unadvised and therefore unengaged, they're unlikely to move to the new pricing? Uh, yes. And that was the assessment that was made by IOOF? Yes. And for members who are advised, if their advisor is receiving a grandfathered trial, they're also unlikely to move to the new pricing? Um, I, 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 I can assume that was an assumption that was made, yes. Is that your view? Um, well, I, I would hope that as we communicate these price point changes that people would be alert and take those matters into their hands to move. But we have to work on some assumptions of past behaviour. And the assumption of past behaviour is that advisors who are receiving a grandfathered trial are unlikely to move their members, notwithstanding that they'll be better off, to the new pricing where they won't receive a grandfathered trail? Uh, in, in our experience, that um, products with grandfathered trails tend to take longer to be moved, yes. I'm sorry, could you say the, that? In our experience, those products tend to take longer to move to a new price point. Notwithstanding that the member will be better off under the new price point? Yes. And again, this information doesn't seem to have been communicated up to the directors in the paper, and in particular then to the independent directors? Um, I'm not sure whether it was discussed in the room, but it doesn't appear to be on their papers, that's correct. And can you see, or do you agree, that what would be in the best interests of this cohort of 29,263 members would be to just move them to the new pricing rather than leaving it to what IOOF considered to be unlikely movement for unadvised members and members with an advisor who were receiving a grandfathered trial? Um, if, if the expectation was that all members would move to the new pricing, the new pricing point would have been a different and more likely higher pricing point. We had to make some assumptions about the likely migration to that new price point, ensuring the sustainability of the fund going forward. I'm just trying to make sure I've understood that. This paper, if we go back to page dot. 0161. This is an analysis in relation to the pricing. This is as at January of 2018. Yes. And then on page two, this is setting out the proposed pricing that's already been designed? Yes. And then 
on page three, there's some general discussion about platform price positioning and the impacts on IES. Yes. And then on page four, there's, a, I'm sorry, page five, there's a discussion of the risks, which is what we've been looking at. Yes. And so that I understand, you're saying if the risk of members moving to the new pricing was thought to be higher than assessed in this paper, then IMO wouldn't have offered the new pricing? Uh, it, yeah, if, if everybody moved to the new pricing, it would be reasonable to expect that the new pricing wasn't sustainable. So the difficulty then was this, was it? You couldn't say to the directors of EML, and in particular the independent directors, it would be in the best interests of approximately 29,000 members to simply move them to the new pricing rather than risking the possibility that advisors wanting to maintain their trail commissions and unadvised members who are disinterested will not benefit from the new pricing. Because if you explain that to them, they might act in the best interests of the members and that would reduce the profitability for IOOF and then it would never have wanted to introduce the new pricing in the first place. Um, I wouldn't expect to have had it put in those terms, but in, in aggregate, if the assumptions made about migration between price points were that everybody moved, then the price changes would simply not be sustainable and therefore not in the interest of all members. I tend to that document, Commissioner. Memorandum 31 January 18, uh, Broom and Mason to IOOF Leadership Group, IFL, uh, 0010-0010-0160, Exhibit 5.113. Commissioner, I don't have any more questions for Mr Oliver. Right. Thank you. Mr Peters? No re-examination, Commissioner. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Peters. You may step down.